This is the panel A meeting um, of the Medical Board of California. I'm Ronald Lewis, chair of panel A, and I'd like to uh, establish a quorum. So if we could call the roll, please. Here. Ms. Liviano? Here. Mr. Wormoth? Here. Ms. Wright? Dr. Yip? Here. Dr. Lewis? Present. Thank you. And before we get started, I'd like to ask the court reporter if she needs names or did you um, write down the names of the board members at all? Hey. Okay. okay, we don't have to say our name before we speak. Well, as, no, you really don't. As long as you don't talk one another. Okay. Thank you. Okay, welcome. Okay, and now I'd like to welcome the ALJ Goldsby, who I will now turn the meeting over to. Um, this is um, first open session, and then we will go into closed session. All right, well, good morning, everybody. Good My name morning. is Matthew Goldsby. Mm -hmm. I've been assigned to preside over this matter. We're now on the record, and it's in the matter of Darren Lyle. I'm sorry, Darren Lyle Birdie, M.D. The case number is 800. Sorry. This is oral argument on a petition for reconsideration before the Medical Board of California. And let me get appearances, please, from both counsel. Yes, Your Honor. Henry Chapman appearing for Dr. Berge. And Dr. Berge is here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Deputy Attorney General Claudia Ramirez, appearing on behalf of the complainant, Julie Kirchmeier, Executive Director of the Medical Board of Health. All right. So how we are going to proceed is we will hear first from the petitioner, who's the respondent in the matter, <clears throat> and we are going to uh, give you 15 minutes to make your oral argument. Then we will turn to complainant for 15 minutes of oral argument. We will conclude with five minutes of closing remarks from each side. Uh, I'm inclined to give you either a one or two minute warning when your time is coming up. Is there a preference from either side? No, Your Honor. All right, I'll give you one minute warning. <clears throat> and um, when your time is up, I'm going to interrupt you. Thank you. All right. So. And then after that, then the board members may have questions. Um, so let's proceed. Mr. Fenton. Yes. Shall I start? <clears throat> Give me one second. I'm going to literally <clears throat> start a timer. And you're on. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. I, I think that our written brief pretty well in sets forth our position, and I think it's very, very clear. This is a most unusual case in the sense that this is perhaps, I've handled hundreds of doctors with medical board cases. This was one where I was very shocked. I wasn't shocked at the criticism of their witness, who I think ha deserves no credibility, this Dr. Miller. He hadn't operated in many years. I don't even think he has a practice. It's, it's in, the, in, in the decision itself. Virtually everything that he said was wrong. His view was that when, a, when somebody has an injury, they should only get pain medications for three months after the injury, otherwise they're misusing, mis, misusing the meds and they're, they're committing some sort of malpractice. He knew nothing about pain. Everything he testified to was not worth, of, worth anything. I have never, we, in contrast, we had 
Dr. Berger, who trained all of the pain physicians at USC. He's full-time faculty still at USC. And we had a, and, and, and Dr. Berge is, has, has written chapters in his field. He's an extraordinary surgeon. His work is wonderful. The, the records, I've never seen such good records. So I was shocked to see these, these, these findings of simple negligence which weren't charged. We didn't, they, they didn't even make an issue about these stupid things that we could have responded to in a minute. The, now, as you know, in terms of what was charged, there's only one finding for which is an argument that it's an accusation, and, and there's one finding of simple negligence. There are five findings of simple negligence, not findings, conclusions by this judge for, of simple negligence, completely unsupported. A simple act of negligence, and, and, and there isn't any, is not a basis for discipline. Let me go through them quickly. RSR is the first one. He came up with a conclusion that, that, uh, that Dr. Berge continued treatment of RSR with pain meds after receiving authorization for a referral to a pain specialist was simple negligence. N the thing was never, that was never charged. It's not true. As, if, we, if that had been charged, Dr. Berge could have pointed out that the patient never went to see the pain specialist, wasn't treated by pain, the pain specialist, then there were difficulties from getting the insurance company to pay, and so it, the thing wasn't charged. It's, it's absurd. And there, there's no allegation, and there was no evidence that, uh, that continued treatment with, with pain meds after receiving authorization um, for the referral to a pain specialist constituted negligence. That's the first one. It's not charged. Four of the five were not charged at all. As a matter of law, it's, it's a violation of due process because they could have simply been responded to. And, and even though there's no evidence virtually with respect to any of them, as a matter of due process, th th there's no case. But I'm gonna go through them quickly. Second one, it's SS. The, the finding somehow is simple negligence in inadequately addressing drug-seeking behavior in connection with SS this is reporting regarding prior injuries. Now, the only allegation in the, in the accusation having to do with uh, inadequately addressing drug-seeking behavior in connection with SS was this. It was respondent prescribed six, I, I mean, I, I, this is on, on page 20, paragraph 68 of the decision. No, uh, of, the, of, the, um, of, the, of the accusation. A quote, per respondent prescribed six Norco a day. Specifically, he prescribed 180 tablets of Norco. He failed to justify the prescription. He also failed to distress, address this strong suggestion of drug-seeking behavior. That's in the accusation. The only thing about that. And the ALJ specifically found in favor of Dr. Berge in this respect. It's at page 22, Judge. Uh, judge uh, Goldsby, page 22, paragraph 60. The finding was, complainant alleged that respondent prescribed the Norco without justification and failed to address this strong suggestion of drug-seeking behavior. Respondent testified, and the evidence corroborates, that he knew SS was taking Norco, but the Norco was for breakthrough pain only. Respo the complainant's only argument in their brief is she combed the record and comes up and relies on a discussion SS had with Dr. Sophia. But there's no allegation in the accusation and no finding by the ALJ or even any testimony by anybody that it could have supported this finding. The next one is on JB. Again, no allegation in the accusation. Four out of five, there's clearly no allegation. No allegation in the accusation whatsoever with respect to this one. Listen, the next finding of simple negligence is overly prolonged treatment of JB with benzodiazepines through November 2014. No, there's nothing anywhere in the accusation about that. While JB was taking opioids as well, no allegation about that. And with respect to respondents' failure to adequately address or document addressing JB's use of alcohol, there's no allegation. It's a violation of due process. There was no expert testimony even by that horrible witness Miller, who knew nothing about pain, has no special knowledge of it, no training in it, and was found countless times to have been wrong by this ALJ on everything that he testified to. No finding whatsoever. 
There was no finding with respect to any failure by Dr. Berge to adequately address the use of alcohol. It wasn't an issue. You know, all of these are such, such stupid little things. He could have any of us could have addressed that if he had been charged in a second, but it wasn't even an issue. And then there's a finding here. Second, another one is TW. Now this is the, it shows you how shocking this was, this testimony. And it's shocking that this ALJ would do this. Listen to this. This is in 2012 or 12, 2000, failure to ask the pharmacy, this, this case is in 2012 or 2000, to run a cures report at the first visit when he was unable to do so by himself. You know that you guys have just sent out a memo in 2018 telling doctors that now you've got to look at cures, cures reports. Is um, raising evidence outside the administrative record. Well, it's a, it's, not be considered. it's not, it's not the that, that you can take judicial notice of what you sent out. And, and I would ask that you do that. It's but anyway. But it, 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 the, the, the objection sustained. All right, all right. But, but the reality is that there was no charge about having to ask a pharmacy for a cures report if you can't run it yourself. This is a patient, the second time she came in, he, he was discharged. By, by, by Dr. Berge. But it's just, it, it underscores how this wasn't charged. It underscores how I don't know why this judge did this because the testimony was so strong in his favor. The findings of their one witness were so strong that this person didn't know what he was talking about. This is this Dr. Miller. And yet you have these findings that are completely unsupported. There was absolutely no evidence to support the charge. And, and they're, and they're at, oh, listen to this. Their expert didn't testify this below the standard of care. So where did he come up with this? He wouldn't testify to that. He was specifically asked. He just said, when he was said, his own lawyer asked him, was it, was it a standard of care to look at the Cures report? This is this guy who didn't know anything. And the answer was, quote, the Cures reports at that time were not 100% reliable. The system wasn't perfect because he knew that there was no, so there's no evidence whatsoever. <clears throat> so that's, that's four of the five. The only, there's, there's one left, which is FH, and those four weren't charged. And, and that one, of, of simple, it says, Dr. Burgi should have followed up on certain EMG electrodiagnostic results in April 2011, whatever that means. That's a finding of negligence, he says that. All of the findings, other, the findings in the decision contradict with that stupid thing. It's not, char it, you know, here, here's what it is. H here are the findings. It says, in that regard, there, there are no findings to support that conclusion. Paragraph 110, th this is from, from the judge's, from the judge's uh, opinion. Complainant alleged that Dr. Miller opined that the EMG report suggested peripheral neuropathy. The MG reviewed, however, noted, reviewer noted, however, there was no peripheral no nerve compression. More importantly, according to respondent, FH's symptoms were not consistent with peripheral neuropathy. His symptoms were in many places radiating, nor did FH have symptoms of CTS. Respondent testified that electrodiagnostics mean nothing without symptoms. That is the point of taking a patient's history and performing a physical exam. This is from the decision. FH complained of pain in his neck radiating down his arm to a small finger, compressing neuropathy of the ulnar or elbow nerve. That does not correlate with CTS. He had no bilateral symptoms. He probably had mild CTS and not diabetic neuropathy. There was no reason to send FH for evaluation for peripheral neuropathy. Next one. This is 116 from the decision. Complainant also charged respondent with a simple departure for failing to consider alternative medical conditions or drug-seeking behavior in light of the electro electrodiagnostic tests. Respondent testified there was no alternative conditions to consider. On September 2011, AME, Dr. Jackson, an orthopedic spine surgeon, had examined FH, found no other conditions to treat, agreed with the prescriptions issued by respondent. This is findings. And recommended the spine surgery respondent performed. The electrodiagnostics showed lumbar radu radiculopathy that eventually required surgery after PT and apparel epidural steroids fa failed to relieve FH's symptoms. They do not reveal any drug seeking by FH. And further, and then it says he ended up, he ended up operating on Dr. Berge and, and got him back to work. All of these five people were sent back to work because of the great work that he did. So 
So that, that in, in essence, is, is and, 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 and I, I would also note that, that one of the, the witnesses, this, this, it's extraordinary because Dr. Nelson, who was the orthopedic surgeon, there's a portion in the, in the decision, it's on page 48, it says overall patient care as reflected in the records, and he talks about Dr. Nelson. And, and there, the, the judge says, delays are inherent in the workers' comp system. Doctors must frequently send authorization requests multiple times, may have to appeal uh, denials. A failure by the workers' comp insurer to approve a procedure does not necessarily mean that the proposed treatment is out the standard, outside the standard of care. If a physician is denied authorization, it would be a departure from the standard of care for him to fail, failure to prescribe a narcotic. It would be a departure from the standard of care to fail to, because it would cause the patient harm. Such withdrawal, and, and that's paragraph 129 of the decision. The, the physician, regardless of authorization, must make a medical judgment, and the physician cannot abandon the patient and send the patient to an emergency room, for example, to obtain meds. And this is a summary. It says overall patient care based upon our witness, his witness, Dr. Nelson's testimony. So what I'm saying is this is the most outrageous case. Don't put, don't make him, punish him. This is a wonderful doctor. If he's found guilty of negligence for no reason, which would be the case here, it's gonna hurt him very much. I mean, I, as I set forth in my brief. And, and he, he's somebody who cures people. They come in, he does all the, the correct referrals and so forth and so on. So, so I, I, I submit to you that this is a most extraordinary case. I don't know what possessed this judge, whether he just felt he had, had to give something to the board, but there's no basis for it, either in law, because it's a violation of due process. Ex the, the only thing that wasn't charged was one simple act of negligence, which isn't a basis for discipline. I thank you. All right. We will now hear from the complainant. Yes, good morning. Uh, first of all, to address that the uh, matters of which the respondent was found, um, uh, for which discipline was imposed were not uh, charged is incorrect. Um, I'd like to start by pointing out that the liberal rules of administrative pleading require only that the licensee be informed of the substance of the charges against them and be provided appropriate elements of procedural due process. And fair notice to the respondent is more important than compliance with technical um, pleading rules. And th this comes from the case of Cooper versus Board of Medical Examiners, year 1975, 49 Cal App, 3rd, 931, and pin site 942. And in that case, the respondent was informed of the substance of the charges and the lack of specificity in the accusation was not material under liberal pleading rules. And I, I would like to point out that in that case, um, the uh, court found that a variance between the allegations of a pleading and the proof will not be deemed material unless it has actually misled the adverse party to his prejudice in maintaining his action or defense on the merits. And a variance may be disregarded when the action has been as fully and fairly tried on the merits as though the variance had not existed. And here the respondent was thoroughly uh, notified that he was charged with um, several theories of, um, of uh, cause for discipline under the Medical Practice Act. Extre uh, gross negligence, repeated negligent acts, excessive prescribing, um, just to name a, a few. I would like to point out that at no point during the hearing did he bring up uh, any objection or raise any issues that he had not been fairly apprised of the theories against him or, or the evidence that had been up brought up uh, during the hearing. It wasn't until his uh, motion for reconsideration that he raised um, that issue. So those, um, his objections have been, have been waived. And unlike the case that he cited in, in his brief, Smith versus State Board of Pharmacy, in, in that case, the respondent had been failed the respondent was not notified of a neg negligence theory, and the um, attorney for the Board of Pharmacy uh, relied on that theory for the first time at hearing, and that's not the case here. We uh, notified the respondent of all theories against them. 
and he fully defended against the charges during the nine uh, day hearing on an accusation that totaled 37 pages. I'd like to point out that respondent attacks complainant's expert, Jeffrey Miller, but what is key is that in it, each of the instances where the ALJ found the departure from the standard of care, the findings were not merely supported by the testimony of Dr. Miller alone. They were actually supported by the testimony of the respondent, his physici prior physician assistant, and even his own testimony. Respondent has cited minimal, minimally to the uh, record, to the documentary evidence, or reporter's transcripts to support his arguments. In comparison, complainant went through um, thoroughly through the evidence and in her brief has cited to the reporter's transcripts and e exhibits that support the ALJ's uh, findings and, and proposed decision. I'll start by going through uh, patient TW. Uh, in this case, the respondent did not see the prescribing red flags and did not check cures prior to issuing pres a prescription when she specifically asked for uh, a controlled substance, including the specific number of pills that she wanted. Um, and he, at that time, the respondent had access to cures because he was a direct dispenser of controlled uh, substances. And notably, he, the respondent acknowledged that when, when he could not access cures on TW's for first visit, which is what he claimed he specifically re remembers happening, that he could have waited until her second visit to prescribe the opioids or requested that the pharmacy run a cures report on TW during the first visit. And we did cite to uh, the transcript where that testimony can, can be found. The respondent also testified that it was a custom and practice of his throughout the evolution of cures to obtain cures reports on his patients. And his own expert, Jack Berger, testified, he's the, the pain management doctor, that physicians depend on the honesty of their patients until they are demonstrated to be unreliable and that you have to trust patients. And on cross-examination, he uh, conceded that although you have to trust the patient, you must also verify. The respondent is citing to only a portion of Dr. Miller's testimony regarding the standard of care. And it's true that he, Dr. Miller initially did state that the cures reports are inaccurate, but he misspoke and we did clarify the next day, uh, April 20th, 2018, which is in the reporter's transcript, uh, volume four at pages 33, line 70, 17 through 22 that he misspoke and, and meant that not that the cures reports are inaccurate, but that sometimes it's difficult, it is difficult to acknowledge that it's difficult to access the cures uh, system. But his point was that he said, quote, so my point was even though it may not be a reliable system, meaning getting the report as quickly as you want, the report should be obtained. And in the case of TW, I said, if you couldn't get it, if the standard of care is a patient comes in asking for drugs, you need to get a cures report. With respect to RSR, again, uh, in this case, the complainant's theory of the case, and specific to RSR, was that um, the patients were workers' compensation patients that did not have conditions justifying the long-term prescribing of opioids and other controlled substances, and that there was no endpoint to their drug treatment because respondents just kept renewing their medications without justification. And Dr. Miller testified that RSR was getting narcotics on a routine basis without, without some explanation or diligence of, or reevaluation, that there was no, an, no endpoint to the controlled substances or narcotics. And in this case, uh, respondents' own testimony supports Dr. Miller in that he said that as of June 20th, 2014, RSR did not require any further diagnostic testing. There was nothing further to evaluate and RSR did not have any new symptoms that required diagnosis. And Dr. Nelson, the respondent's orthopedic surgeon expert said, 
that the endpoint for a physician treating chronic pain is transferred to a pain specialist. And Dr. Berger, the pain management expert for respondents, said that respondent was obligated to continue prescribing opioids and other medications to RSR until a patient could be transferred to a pain management specialist. And the evidence showed that respondent received authorization to transfer RSR to a pain management doctor on July 18, 2014, but kept prescrib prescribing those medications until January 21st, 2015. And if it's true that RSR uh, didn't uh, go see a pain management uh, specialist. Well, then it was incumbent on respondent to not continue prescribing those controlled substances. That was his responsibility. Uh, with respect to JB, the um, medical records for JB, the, the numerous prescriptions for this patient, and the board's own 2007 and 2014 guidelines for prescribing support the finding that there was a prolonged prescribing of ben benzodiazepines while JB was concurrently taking opioids. And interestingly enough, Dr. Berger, again, respondent's own pain, pain management expert, testified that physicians have to be careful when prescribing opioids and benzodiazepines because abuse of, of those uh, medications can cause respiratory depression. So again, we have testimony by respondents' own experts supporting the findings that were made in this case by the administrative law judge. Uh, the JB had a serious use, the JB serious use of alcohol was relevant to respondents' treatment of JB for chronic pain. And we did know that in the accusation that by the time JB um, had uh, towards the end of treatment with um, the respondent that he had turned to alcohol and lost weight. And so the respondent should have addressed the fact that JB was consuming alcohol while, pr while consuming opioids. So the fact that he was on alcohol is interrelated, that he was con the fact that he was consuming alcohol is interrelated with the prescribing of, of opioids. And Dr. Miller testified that according to the medical records, JB had been consuming alcohol since approximately mid-2014 to help him sleep and cope with his chronic pain. And that JB was consuming alcohol on top of psychiatric and narcotic medications. He opined that respondent departed from the standard of care because he did, the respondent didn't stay on top of JB's care and treatment and didn't look at it comprehensively. So by the time um, the a psychiatrist w withdrew his endorsement of um, respondent prescribing uh, psychiatric medications to JB, JB had a serious alcohol problem and a decline in psychiatric condition. With respect to SS, this uh, SS was an unreliable and opportunity opportunistic historian with an extensive history of medication use, which should have been red flags for potential drug-seeking behavior. And it was alleged in the accusation that um, respondent did not address uh, SS uh, drug-seeking behavior. It was alleged in the second cause for discipline. Uh, we again have testimony from respondent's own expert that supports uh, Dr. Miller's testimony and the findings by the ALJ. And Dr. Berger acknowledged that SS history of opioids may have been a red flag for opioid seeking behavior and stated that SS history only meant that respondent had to adequately monitor SS and not discontinue the medications. Well, in this case, that's where the departure is, that respondent did not adequately monitor SS. And he didn't acknowledge or address those uh, drug seeking behaviors, but instead merely prescribed her regular medications. And we um, have a report from Dr. Sophia documenting that S has attempted to change his, ex his report on her. We have a, a document in the medical records re reflecting five pages of um, statements indicating the reasons why she believes his, uh, Dr. Sophia's report is incorrect. With respect to FH, um, there were electrodiagnostics diagnostics dated April 11, 2011 that suggested peripheral neuropathy in the upper extremities. And the respondent did not consider medical conditions that can cause peripheral neuropathy and didn't follow up on the electrodiagnostics. diagnostics. Dr. Berger 
respondent's own expert stated that he conceded that the electrodiagnostic findings uh, meant that there was, it was possible that there was a sensory deficit in the median nerve related to pain and that it would have been reasonable to do a workup. So that uh, supports the findings here in this case by the, the ALJ. So if, if FH did have a medical condition causing peripheral neuropathy in the upper extremities, then it could have been treated medically. Um, instead of routine, routinely renewing narcotics every month and sending FH to Dr. a Dr. J. Kim for more injections. Um, the respondent read from paragraph 110 and paragraph 116 of the decision, but those paragraphs can't be read in isolation from the rest of the decision. What the ALJ is doing there is he's merely recounting the testimony of the respondent. He's, um, he's not necessarily indicating that he's uh, agreeing with it, but only identifying the defense as being raised by the, the respondent. Counsel, you have one minute. Okay. Um, and in paragraph 112, the judge talks about how FH still needed to take pen, pain medications despite the end of treatment uh, by the, the respondent. So even though he returned to work, he still had pain, pain that had not been thoroughly uh, addressed by uh, working up, doing a workup based on those electronic um, diagnostic, electrodiagnostics. In, in, the, in some public protection warrants adoption of the proposed penalty in its entirety, it bears a direct relationship to the findings in this case. They're consistent with the disciplinary guidelines. And um, the uh, evidence demonstrates that the penalty is appropriate and the respondent has shown no reason for deviating from the guidelines. All right, thank you. I will right, we'll now turn to closing remarks. Mr. Fenton? Let me just, no, let me just do this first. Okay, I, I, I would like to make a closing remark, but can Dr. Ber Dr. Berge really wants to address the panel on something. Can I, when I'm done, can, is that okay? With well, you can panel? reserve time from your five minutes if you want. I have five minutes? Oh, yeah. I'll, 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 okay, so then I'll, but, I'm not going to take five minutes. So I'm going to, the two of you have to go within five minutes of time. I hear you. You understand? Okay. The only thing I was going to say is what council is doing, first of all, there is huge prejudice because these are very specific charges. Like I said on SS, the charge was, simple negligence in, ad, in inadequately addressing drug-seeking behavior in connection with SS's reported, reporting um, prior injuries. And the only allegation in the, in, the, in the accusation had to do with Norco. And she keeps doing that. In other words, and, and, I, and, and, and there, was not, there was nothing, there was, there was nothing, and in Norco, and Norco he found in favor of the doctor. Counsel, what she does in her paper, if you look at it, this is with respect, and she keeps doing this on her whole thing. Uh, she, on page 16 of her complaint, of her complainant's brief, she looks at, there's no, no testimony about this. She sees there's some discussion about Dr. Sophia. Dr. Complainant combed the record and relies on a discussion SS had with Dr. Sophia. It has nothing to do with any testimony by any expert. There was no such allegation in the accusation and no finding by the ALJ or even testimony that could have supported any such finding. These very specific little tiny things, if, if they had been charged, would have been easily addressed. The, the, the main things were addressed, and this wasn't addressed, so there's, hu there's huge prejudice. And she's just citing to things in the record that weren't even a, an issue, any, any little thing. You know, uh, so, so that's what I wanted to tell you. It, it, isn't, tr it isn't true that, that, that there was anything that they alleged that was at issue, that, that, that our, expert, our expert said there was no negligence and no gross negligence. She takes things out of context. An expert is asked, is it, is it true you should look at electrodiagnostics? And the guy says, yeah, you should. And he did, and we have all these findings, how he did great. All right. D Dr. Berge wants to say something. And All right, very good. We'll hear from the doctor. Thank you. for. Uh, if I could just go through a couple things, specifically from the DAG's uh, brief to answer what she said. On RSR, if you'd please look at page, seven, page 14, lines 25 and 26. The care and treatment had officially come to an end, it says on this patient, when I received an authorization for transfer. And on page same page, page 15, line 4, Dr. Berger says that until a patient could be, I would treat the patient until the patient could be transferred. 
My care had not come to an end because an insurance company authorized a transfer of care that I requested. I requested a pain management consult to, to obtain a transfer of care. As each of my colleagues here knows, the process to obtain a transfer of care is to obtain a consult from a pain management doctor, a urologist, an internist, have that doctor see the patient, evaluate them, and then accept them for care. Had I not continued to treat my patient until that had been obtained, it would have been a patient abandonment. And my records in October and January following the two visits I saw identified that that's what I was doing that a pain management consult was forthcoming in October, and then in January, re-requested a consult authorization because it hadn't been provided. On SS, page 16, lines 15 and 16, it's indicated that the fact that I failed to suspect drug-seeking behavior in this patient because of her history of previous work injuries before I saw her. I saw her 10 months after this injury and she was already on 10 Norco a day. A different surgeon had already seen her and treated her as well. I did also. It says this is where the departure lies. The failure to properly monitor SS by suspecting drug seeking behavior is found on page 15, lines 15 and 16 on page 16. Dr. Berger, you got a minute. I did monitor this patient. It's well within the records. Urine toxicology scans. She didn't have any escalating medication use. Monitoring her, I did do. The change that I didn't, that what, is, what she presented was a previous history of complaints, which was a work comp injury that related to apportionment and her financial gain. It wasn't related to medications. I did monitor her, and the, where the failure lies on page 16, I did monitor her. I've never been found to be guilty of that. On FH, please look at page 10, line 23, 24, 25. Left leg pain to the shin and foot, that's an L5 distribution. Right arm pain to the small finger. That's an ulnar nerve distribution, not a median nerve. Page 11, lines 19, 20, 21, 22. It's the EMG, L5 radiculopathy without evidence of peripheral compression, peripheral nerve compression, and mild carpal tunnel syndrome. Carpal tunnel goes to these three fingers, not the small finger. Dr. Berge, your time is up. Okay. Thank you. All right, well, now to go to closing remarks from complainant. Yes, the, um, our, our brief thoroughly addresses the, um, where the evidence uh, can be found, um, both from the administrative record and the uh, reporter's transcripts. I would like to point out that during the trial, we went over Dr. Sophia's uh, report uh, thoroughly. We went over the um, history of the patient's prior uh, chronic uh, opioid use, and this is with respect to patient SS, and I'm specifically referring to exhibit uh, V at pages 488 and 489, where it was documented, um, where SS corrections to Dr. Um, Sophia's report, uh, the, her corrections were documented. So that was addressed at length during the hearing. And as far as RSR, the, um, again, the respondent himself testified that by June 20th, 2014, RSR did not require any further diagnostic testing. There was nothing further to evaluate and RSR did not have any new symptoms that required diagnosis. And um, that's also uh, in our brief, as well as it includes the citations to, to the evidence where that can be found. And the evidence showed that there was a, an authorization specifically for um, referral to a pain management specialist. So the, um, in this case, the ALJ's findings are amply supported by the, the evidence. And the, um, uh, but the public protection warrants that, that the uh, proposed penalty be adopted in its entirety. All right, thank you. We'll now turn to questions from the members of the board. Dr. Yip, do you have any questions? 
Uh, thanks for coming. Um, I'm not sure I can ask, but have you changed the way you practice ever since uh, the past few years? Uh, yes, I have. I, uh, as, and I'll point to, uh, I've, I've passed, I've changed the way I've practiced over the past three years, and I'll, if I may, I'll point to also uh, page 26 of the DAG's response to the board, lines 9 and 10. I'll just tell him. Oh, yeah. He's just asking you. I know, but I'm also substantiating that it's been shown in the record as well that I evolved my practice from the dates of the treatment of these patients uh, through the course of my practice thereafter. I uh, began the first functional restoration program, which is a multidisciplinary approach to treating chronic pain patients uh, based upon the 2016 CDC guidelines. Uh, through that program, I've, it, we've, we've decreased patients' opioid use on chronic pain patients who came into the program by 50% uh, overall, meaning 25% completely came off their medications. The use of opioids is, has progressively changed throughout the board's guidelines in 2007 and 14, and then the CDC guidelines in 2016. My practice continually changed along with it, I'm, and I'm pointing out to the DAG's own response in page 26, lines 9 and 10, lines 24 and 25, and page 27, line 5, where it indicates that in my testimony I discussed the CDC guidelines in 2016 and, and the change to not use opioids with benzodiazepines at all. Prior to that, there was not a preclusion from it, but a very big cautionary measure, and I followed those guidelines, and my testimony followed that as well. And it was my custom and practice to give them cautiously, even under the direction of the psychiatrist, who was the re recommending treating doctor or s expert in JB, which is found on page 8, line 19 of her report, wherein even though psychiatric medications for benzodiazepines and JB who had PTSD and anxiety from a head-on collision and opioid requirements for chronic pain, the custom and practice was to, was to prescribe them as a psychiatrist recommended as well as the needs post-operatively, but, but the recommendation was not to take them at the same time either. And the one time that he had an, an alcohol test that showed positive for alcohol, it was not positive for Xanax or benzodiazepines or for the oxycodone. He didn't take them at the same time. That was my recommendation. I treated, evaluated through the guideline changes. I don't treat with opioids except for a brief period of time post-operatively, and I don't treat chronic pain patients any longer. Thanks. Dr. Lewis, any questions? All right, then we'll turn to uh, Ms. Lupiano. Do you have any questions? No questions at this um, Dr. Hawkins? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you for your prior answer. Uh, just two questions. Um, one is, do you still treat workers' compensation patients? The second question is, did any of the patients you were treating in these uh, have a PCP or primary care physicians? I, I'm no, I served as the primary treating physician in all these patients, and, uh, and, the, and they did not have primary care physicians. They, uh, RSR was, uh, well, had no private insurance. Most of them did not have private insurance. And the problem with getting their care, just like JB, didn't have access to a psychiatrist. Insurance company wouldn't provide authorization for a psych psychiatrist for treatment. I had actual... Uh, a treating psychologist who helped with that treatment under the AME of, of in psychiatry. Those are the limitations I had as not being able to have patients who had primary care physicians, uh, health insurance, and essentially I treated them uh, and provided them care. That was that was what I part of what I did to treat these underprivileged people. But the and I did my best. I don't take care. I don't do primary treating physician work any longer. I do still operate on some workers' compensation patients as a secondary treating consultant only in surgery, but I no longer do primary treat work. David Warmoth, do you have any questions? Uh, no, no, thank you. Well, I last opportunity? Yes, maybe. Dr. Lewis? Hi, um, Dr. Berge. How is your, maybe you've answered this before, how is your um, method for obtaining uh, pain management specialists changed 
um, from previous years to currently? Um, and do you mean uh, how do I obtain consults for such or? The, so, two things. One is the um, I went through the same process to to re remove myself as the primary treating physician in the patients that I was currently treating uh, after after the trial, and I went through the process of requesting pain management consult for a transfer of care by the insurance company. I waited until it was authorized, and I transferred the patient once that, once they had seen the co patient, doctor consult, and the transfer of care was made, and and in, a, in an attempt to not abandon the patients, uh, what I've done other than pain management consults, uh, I also wrote letters to the attorneys and let them know I would no longer be functioning as a primary treating physician, and then let the new primary treating physician request whatever pain management trans consults for a transfer of care to be obtained. What do I do now is when I see a patient as a surgical consult, I let the patient know that I will be doing surgery and I'll provide surgical, I'll provide opioids for the, for the first post-operative visit and whoever referred the patient will be responsible either for obtaining the pain management consult for chronic pain management or they'll be responsible themselves. Any other board members have a question? Hearing no questions, we will conclude the hearing and the board will now go into closed session. Thank you very much. All right, we're off the record. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's go on the record. All right, the hearing is open now in the matter of Kenneth Benjamin Hughes, MD. The case number is 800 0 0 the OAH number is 2019040526. This is a, a hearing on oral argument on a non adopted proposed decision. Today is May 9th, 2019, and the hearing is being conducted in Los Angeles, California. My name is Matthew Goldsby. I'm the administrative law judge for the hearing. Let me get appearances, please. Uh, my name is uh, Robert Bell. I'm a supervising deputy attorney general. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, may it please the board. My name is John Harwell. Uh, I represent Dr. Uh, Hughes. Good morning as well, Your Honor. Casey Diva as well on behalf of Dr. Kenneth B. Hughes. Can you spell and your Honor, name? Doc, sorry. Can I get you to spell your name for the record? Casey, K-A-S-E-Y, last name. Case, lower please. First name. Casey, K-A-S-E-Y, last name, Diva, D-I-V-A. Thank you. And Your Honor, Dr. Hughes is with us today. Is Dr. Hughes going to uh, testify today? Uh, not intended to, but here to ask any qu answer any questions the board may have. All right, thank you. Um, I understand that uh, the parties have agreed that uh, we'll hear first from complainant. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, so each party is going to be given uh, 15 minutes of time. I will give you a one-minute warning um, if we get to that point. And then we will have five minutes of closing remarks from each side. So Mr. Bell, are you ready to uh, give us your oral argument? Um, yes, just one second. I'll set my little stopwatch also. All right, so you can, can uh, be reminded. Thank you. Very good, all right. Mr. Bell. Uh, Dr. Lewis, um, Mr. Goldsby, and members of Panel A. Uh, we are here today, of course, because you have not adopted a proposed decision involving Dr. Kenneth Hughes in which the administrative law judge found that the board did not support its allegations by clear and convincing evidence to a reasonable certainty. Consistent with these findings, the ALJ concluded that a dismissal was the appropriate outcome in this matter. You have solicited argument on the issue of whether the decision should be modified to impose discipline to protect the public. The answer to that question is no. In our brief, we discuss the evidence in considerable detail. As you have already read that, I will simply summarize the key points that led to this outcome of dismissal. The accusation as originally filed 
alleged causes for discipline related to the treatment of five patients. The board relied upon the written expert report and trial court testimony of an experienced plastic surgeon certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery. However, as we have explained in the brief, it was amended to three patients after the exchange of discovery and further review of that material by the board's expert. This, that is the cutting down of an accusation after being filed, is not uncommon. So let us consider the three patients about whom testimony was given at the trial. The first of these was patient YW, uh, in which it was alleged there was post-surgical abandonment. YW was a patient who underwent liposuction and gluteal fat grafting. Her operation, which lasted about two hours, was performed midday on Friday, on a Friday in April of 2014. She was released to go home about 4 o'clock in the afternoon with an after-hours phone number to call in the event of a problem or concern. The transcript also reveals that uh, Dr. Hughes provided the patient with his own personal cell phone number. She testified that she was in considerable pain and distress after her surgery and started calling the number that she was given on Saturday afternoon. After several messages were left, her call was returned by a nurse named Olga Amador and the patient and the nurse spoke several times on Saturday and the following day, Sunday. Ultimately, the patient was taken to an emergency room at a Kaiser facility on Sunday evening with complaints of abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, fever, and an inability to keep down her oral pain medication. She underwent exploratory surgery, which revealed she had a perforated bowel and cellulitis sepsis, which were potentially fatal conditions if left untreated. In his opinion, our expert did not focus on the injury to the patient, that is the perforated bowel, but rather to what he referred to as the doctor's abandonment of the patient over the weekend, despite her potentially fatal complications. The position of the defense was that Dr. Hughes had not been told of his patient's call, calls or of her deteriorating condition over the weekend. Nurse Amador was called as a witness in this hearing and testified that she could not recall telling Dr. Hughes of the patient's messages. Her notes of her weekend contact with the patient also do not document such a call to the respondent. In addition, Dr. Hughes denied receiving a weekend call from Nurse Amador and testified he was available by phone the entire time, that is, throughout the weekend. Thus, the evidence did not establish that the respondent learned of YW's post-surgery symptoms over the weekend before she was taken to the emergency room on Sunday evening. Because there was no evidence that the nurse called Dr. Hughes about the patient's complaint, the issue of abandonment of YW over the weekend after her surgery was not supported by clear and convincing evidence to a reasonable certainty. That's what the judge found. In this case, our own expert testified that a doctor could not be held responsible under circumstances where news of his patient's declining condition was not relayed to him. Turning now to the second patient, patient T.W. This was a 43-year-old woman on whom a respondent performed liposuction and gluteal fat grafting at a surgical center in July of 2015. Uh, please recall for a moment the date I just mentioned, July 2015, because it will prove important in what I will tell you soon. The surgery performed um, was a so-called Brazilian butt lift, that's what it's known in the industry, in which the patient's own fat is harvested and then injected into the mu muscle of the buttocks to provide a more aesthetically pleasing profile. In the course of the surgery, the patient developed a cardiac arrhythmia, decompensated rapidly and was pronounced dead within a few hours. A postmortem established that she had developed a fat embolism. Our expert was of the view that this operation, this form of operation, injecting harvested fat into the deep muscle of her um, buttocks, was a departure from the standard of care. Our expert's testimony was countered with the testimony of Dr. Hughes, plus two experienced and board certified plastic surgeons who both testified that the incision entry point for the cannula was unremarkable and within the standard of care. Most importantly, one defense expert, Dr. Mofid, M-O-F-I-D, 
testified that he chaired a task force on gluteal fat grafting for the Aesthetic Surgery Education and Research Foundation, ASERF, A-S-E-R-F, that surveyed almost 5,000 plastic surgeons about this procedure. The task force report published in late 2017, now remember the surgery was two years before that, in 2015, the task force report published in late 2017 found that the Brazilian butt lift surgery had the highest rate of mortality of any plastic surgery procedure, astonishingly, about one in 3,000 patients, with some data suggesting one in 2,200 patients because of the risk of fat emboli. These findings were broadly circulated to the profession in an urgent warning in August 2018. Again, 2018. Dr. Mofid testified that before 2017, that is before the initial report, plastic surgeons commonly performed, performed deeper intramuscular fat injections to maximize the rate of survival of the fat tissue, which at the time of TW surgery in 2015 was within the standard of care, they said. Now only subcutaneous fat injection is recommended and pointing the injection cannula downwards should be avoided. A second defense expert was called, Dr. Das, D-A-S-S, and he testified that the incision entry point used in TW surgery, which could be seen from her autopsy photographs, was within the standard of care in 2015, and one Dr. Das himself has seen used before by other plastic surgeons. He testified that he himself used to perform intramuscular fat injections during gluteal fat grafting, but no longer does so in response to the risks associated with that technique identified in the ACE SURF report in 2017 and in the urgent warning in 2018. Notably, the ALJ, after hearing this testimony, found that the standard of care for this operation used by our expert, who condemned it, and upon which the board relied in filing its charges, came into being in 2018, three years after the 2015 surgery on this patient. As noted in his proposed decision, he also found that the testimony of two defense experts plus Dr. Hughes was persuasive evidence that plastic surgeons commonly performed deeper fat injections in 2015 at the time of TW surgery before discovery of the alarming risks of mortality from fat emboli correlated with intramuscular fat injection. Given this testimony, the judge wrote, the overall evidence did not establish the standard of care departure in TW surgery that Dr. Stone, our expert, described. While this patient's surgical outcome was deeply regrettable, the board cannot sustain discipline against Dr. Hughes for modalities and methods allowed by the standard of care at the time he performed them. The third and final patient, whose initials are NL, saw respondent for silicone butt implants, buttock implants. The board expert found that the informed consent discussion between Dr. Hughes and this patient, NL, amounted only to the patient being given an insert from the box in which the prosthesis was taken, that is, manufacturer's literature, and that such a form of consent was not adequate because it would not be understandable to laypersons, a quite understandable explanation. Our expert's opinion, however, was changed when confronted with later produced defense evidence in the form of defense exhibit QQQ, which was not produced in the investigation nor seen by our expert when he, when he formed his opinions. This evidence established that patient NL had signed various consents and disclosures for this surgery performed in November 2015, which she did not recall signing when she was interviewed by the board. At the hearing, to make things a little more interesting still, patient NL testified that the signature on the consents being shown by the defense was not hers. However, a handwriting expert was called by the defense and testified that it was her signature after comparing it to other signatures NL acknowledged were genuine. The handwriting expert's testimony was considered persuasive by the administrative law judge and seriously undercut the credibility of patient NL. In these cases, we bear the heavy burden of establishing the charged facts by clear and convincing evidence to a reasonable certainty, the Edinger standard that you've heard so much mentioned. The board had one expert who unfortunately applied the wrong standard of care for patient TW and was confronted with additional evidence of informed consent unknown to the board for patient NL. 
Finally, a nurse changed her testimony at trial to allow for the possibility that the messages from patient YW were received by her but were not given by her to Dr. Hughes. If the board modifies a propo this proposed decision, a petition for writ of administrative mandamus challenging its action would doubtless ensue. In that setting, the Superior Court would give considerable weight, as it must, to the ALJ's evidentiary rulings in favor of Dr. Hughes, and especially to the ALJ's findings regarding respondents' medical experts, because the ALJ was a participant in the trial and observed the witnesses testify, their demeanor, and so forth. A trial court's finding as to the weight of evidence and credibility are considered conclusive on appeal. So despite our displeasure, with how things unfolded, on balance and in fairness, the ALJ's factual findings underlying his decision to dismiss the accusation are supported by the evidence, and it is the Attorney General's position that due to the conflicting expert opinions, the evolving standard of care, and the previously undiscovered evidence that was presented at the hearing, coupled with the ALJ's evidentiary rulings and credibility findings modifying the decision for any reason, including public safety, would be difficult to sustain on judicial review. Our advice is adopt the proposed decision. Thank you very much. We will now turn to uh, respondents. Mr. Harwell. Good morning and thank you. In the 40 years that I've been representing physicians before the board, I've not had the occasion to have the Attorney General make my argument for me but I do in fact adopt everything he has said and, res and it is evidence of the respect that those of us who represent physicians have for the Attorney General's office that Mr. Bell has come forward with uh, his uh, brief and his presentation. There are only a couple of things that I think that should be added. Uh, those of us who do this for a living know that the Attorney General relies entirely on the expert advice that's given to them. They're not doctors. They listen to, this case started when a competitor filed a complaint um, in order to avoid uh, a lawsuit. And uh, when the complaint comes in, the board is obliged by law to investigate the complaint. And when the board investigates the complaint, they send it off to an expert for review. And they rely upon that expert's advice. In this case, the expert was in our view, both corrupt, but also uh, lied uh, uh, profusely in this case, and we don't know why. Um, one of the things the expert argued initially was that we had not filed the death or transfer report that is sent to the board. And it's in part because it wasn't found in the patient's records, which are maintained by the competitor physician, not by Dr. Hughes. Uh, we asked the board to look itself, and indeed they found that the documents had been filed. The expert did not take up the simple requir requirement of calling the board to see if those documents were on file before he opined that it was an extreme departure not to have filed them. Uh, this expert revised his opinions five times throughout the course of the case. Every time we re read his opinion, we responded with how he was factually incorrect, and he backed down each of those times. Uh, at some point, we believed the board should have taken action to stop this case. We believe that the attorney general who was given the information passed them on because we know the deputy, and he's an honorable person, and he indicated he had. And we are concerned that this was not stopped early enough to prevent the kinds of harm that we all know happen to physicians when the accusation goes up on the website. A couple of points in aid of what Mr. Bell said. The witness who testified about not having contacted Dr. Hughes over the weekend was not his nurse. It was the nurse of the competitor physician at, with whom he was practicing. She had no interest at all in uh, serving Dr. Hughes's uh, best interest. She, was a, she worked for a competitor. Um, because you're not able to see uh, the testimony as it unfolds, uh, we believe that as a matter of law, you are unable to judge the credibility. 
you can't see the, 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 the medical board's experts try to move a cannula through the solid bone of the sacrum in order to reach the point he said the, that the cannula had reached. You can't see him, his efforts of trying to find a way to take a cannula and turn it up 90 degrees, tear, what obviously would tear a great amount of tissue to do in order to achieve his theory. And you can't watch the other experts show how what the vet board's expert, Mr. Dr. Stone, said was physically impossible as a mat matter of anatomy. You can't see w the, the witness in L the look on her face when she was confronted with her signed consents that she testified emotionally and with great vigor she had never seen before. Uh, you can't see the look on the face of uh, the people in the room when the expert uh, handwriting uh, uh, a witness arrived minutes later to testify that she had in fact uh, looked at all of the, the uh, signatures and that uh, NL was simply lying. It's very hard to understand how this case got as far as it did. Uh, we, don't, we don't blame the, the, uh, the Attorney General's office at all. The deputy that did this case is someone known to me for 20 years and who I regard, regard highly. And obviously, we all have great, great regard and, and, uh, and hold uh, Mr. Bell in high esteem. But somebody should have stepped in on this case and made it stop before uh, all the harm that happens to any physician happens when their name goes up uh, on, a, uh, uh, on a website accusing them of killing patients. And uh, with that, we, uh, we would join in um, asking this board to agree with uh, Judge Heller to agree with us and to agree with the Attorney General that this case should be dismissed and that, his, that the uh, Judge Heller's opinion should be adopted. All right, thank you. We'll go to closing remarks. Mr. Bell, five minutes. I have nothing further to add. Mr. Harwell? No, thank you. All right, then we'll turn to questions from the board. Um, Dr. Hughes, are you prepared to answer some questions? I think so. Can, can we make sure we can hear him? Uh, let me have you raise your right hand to be sworn. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the answers you give the board today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, let's start with Ms. Wright. Do you have any questions? Dr. Yip, do you have any questions? Dr. Lewis, any questions? None for me. Ms. Lubiano, any questions? No questions. Dr. Hawkins, any questions? No. David Warmoth, any questions? No. All right, with that, we will conclude the hearing. Thank you all very much, and we are off the record.